<clears throat> hey everybody, Calm here, and this is my 2005 Suzuki Jimny O2 edition, in fact, and it is the greatest four-wheel drive vehicle ever made. Prepare for the most extraordinary event of your lifetime. An event that will forever alter the course of mankind and womankind. The next major turning point in the history of all civilization. Yes, the humble, ever underrated Suzuki Jimny. The unbelievably small, unbelievably simple and unbelievably capable four-wheel drive mini SUV that has been a staple both on and off the road around the world since 1970. The original Suzuki Jimny was introduced in 1970 and was originally based on the obscure Hope Star ON360. Suzuki had purchased the bankrupt Hope Star Motor Company in 1968 and were impressed by the capabilities of the tiny low production ON360, which in trials had almost managed to summit Mount Fuji itself. Despite being thrown together on what looks like tin cans and an engine from a lawnmower, this miniature SUV eventually evolved into the first generation Suzuki Jimny LJ10. Built on a sturdy ladder frame chassis, solid front and rear axles, with a transfer case that could switch between rear wheel drive and four wheel drive, with little competition in Japan and few competitors of a similar size, it became an instant success. And the first generation was followed by a second in 1981, commonly known as the Suzuki Samurai in the States, and then a third generation in 1998. And that is what I own, 2005 Suzuki Jimny. Now this is a third generation Suzuki Jimny and for context they released this first in 1998 and they stopped production in 2018. Think of all the generations of cars, the upgrades, the advancements in car design and technology that happened over those two decades and they were still making the Jimny in the exact same way. So that title as the best four-wheel drive vehicle, well I know that's a little bit of clickbait but I will say there is a significant argument that could be made that the Suzuki Jimny and more importantly the lineage of the Suzuki Jimny, the family that represents it from the first generation all the way up to the newest fourth generation is the most consistent, the most well designed and the most true to its roots as a small, capable and affordable off-roader. Now what I want to do over the course of this video is give you a little bit of a tour of my Suzuki Jimny and tell you a little bit more about why it is so perfectly suited to where I live on the small island of Rassi. So this is the exterior of my Suzuki Jimny, and actually this is where I keep it. This is my land. I know it looks a little bit like a wasteland right now, but check back here in the future. Maybe I'll have a house built up there. I actually keep this next to my tractor, which sort of shows the, uh, uh, I guess, where it positions itself in how I use it <laughs> around, around the island. Now, I really like the look of the Suzuki Jimneys um, through all the models. I do think that the third generation is somewhat of the black sheep. Um, it is slightly more rounded. Um, it has this slightly more bubbly look to it compared to the more sharp angular lines um, of the previous and now the newer later generations. Um, now this is of course designed originally to fit within the K-car regulations. Um, in Japan they were sold with a slightly smaller engine and these white plastic uh, trims that run round the edge and kind of bulge out over the tires uh, were not included. You can technically take these things off, although I would be very worried to try because <laughs> getting them back on again would probably not be very easy. Better to just let the rust eat into it and they'll fall off by themselves. Now, the vehicle itself, uh, I believe 3.6 meters, uh, I'll correct that underneath here <laughs> if that is uh, incorrect, and about 1.4 meters wide. Pretty small, but something to keep in mind, this is actually longer and just ever so slightly wider, I believe, than um, both the first and second generation three-door Land Rovers. And maybe that should go to show just how much those vehicles have actually grown over the years and over the generations, while the Suzuki Jimny has relatively kept to the same dimensions that it began life with in the 1970s. If anything, grown just ever so slightly, but really not that much. Um, now, Pretty bare bones, pretty basic. One thing you might notice, this is the O2 edition Suzuki Jimny. Now, the O2 edition was a special edition released, uh, I believe, 
maybe early 2000s to around 2009. And the big thing about the Suzuki Jimny 02 edition was that it was a soft top. Now, um, in the original spec, both this and this were canvas. This piece folded back, revealing the back seats as kind of open areas. And then you could pull back this, leaving the sort of structural pillars, and that's about it. Um, now, for this, this came with, I believe, a, a dealer accessory hard top um, when I bought it. I don't have the soft top, and to be honest, it's not really something I, <laughs> I want, to be honest. However, um, this removes quite easily, and I'll actually show that to you. Essentially, you've got four clips, two at the front and two at the back. And the whole thing, basically, lifts off. Now... <clears throat> Slightly frustratingly, uh, it doesn't fit anywhere in the car. So once you have it off, you've got to basically just put it to one side. <laughs> but now with the roof off, it's got a bit of a weird look to it. It just is this, it almost, it reminds me of like a monk that has the, the little bald patch and then the hair around it. it. It doesn't look cool. When I think of a convertible car, even if this was folded down, I don't think it would look very good, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I actually think the best spec for these canvas top ones, or rag tops as they're sometimes known, is the one that basically has just the flat canvas here. So there's no fold, it basically just creates a flat line across the back. That, I quite like that. Now, one interesting addition um, that you might notice in this that you won't get in a standard Suzuki Jimny is the fact that I have manual locking hubs. So the third generation was, I believe, the first that came with vacuum locking hubs. So how it worked was you either pulled the lever or pushed the button that put you into four wheel drive mode. There was an air system that would then lock the front hubs because if they were left unlocked, putting into four wheel drive would do absolutely nothing because the power would basically go nowhere. Now, the thing is those vacuum um, tubes and the, the vacuum system broke all the time. So it worked once when I first got this thing and then I went under the van and found that basically all the pipes had corroded away to nothing. So I basically stripped out the pipes uh, and that system and I replaced it with manual locking hubs. And all it means is before you go into four wheel drive mode, you've got to get out, you've got to switch this over the four wheel drive on each side and then you get back in and then you engage the four wheel drive mode. Perfectly acceptable to do. Uh, to be honest, this being what it is, a part-time four-wheel drive vehicle with open differentials at the front and rear, you should only be using a four-wheel drive uh, in this in extreme circumstances. Even this off-road isn't necessary. It's when it gets slippy and it gets very uneven that you need it. If you do use the four-wheel drive mode on tarmac and on regular roads, um, you are probably going to do significant damage to the drivetrain. So uh, these things actually, to me, are really useful and um, they're the best addition, certainly, that I've made to this. We've actually been clearing all this land around here to create a road up to my house. And needless to say, a chimney is very handy for manoeuvring through small forests. See, people forget about some of the real useful aspects of a small four-wheel drive vehicle. That go-anywhere ability is fine, but when your vehicle's too big to fit between two trees, well, you're not going anywhere. Now, while my use of the Jimny is slightly less intense compared to many off-roaders, the Jimny does have some serious off-road credentials. In 2007, a second-generation modded Jimny achieved the highest summit ever set by a vehicle, reaching an impressive 6,688 metres above sea level in the Andean Mountains. I, too, have set my own impressive records with the Jimny. In 2018, I became the very first person to comfortably sleep inside a Jimny. And uh, needless to say, it was an incredible experience that I uh, won't soon forget. <sighs> you know, you can fully stretch out. You're, you're up, so you're lying up in bed, which, uh, you know, I know some people wouldn't like. I don't mind. Uh, I broke my hip a few years ago, and I had to lie like this in bed for like three or four days in the hospital. So, you know, it reminds me of the good old days. Um, well, it is 6 a.m. And I must say, I had a oh, amazing sleep. 
don't think I even woke up once. I mean, it helped, I suppose, that I was very tired. But that was way comfier than camping, for one. Now, it's very unlikely that I'm going to be driving this thing up a mountain anytime soon. But what I will say is that, you know, I live on a very small island. I live on the Isle of Rasse. Rasse is about 14 miles long. It's about three and a half miles wide. Um, there are, well, probably less that in, in terms of roads, maybe, I don't know, 10 miles of roads in total. And all of the roads are horrendous. They are bumpy and creaky and they are full of potholes. In the summertime, they're clogged with tourists. They are all single tracks. So you've got to try and use laybys where you can. In the autumn time, they're completely flooded with water. And in the winter time, they're probably covered in ice and snow. So what you really need is a vehicle that you don't really mind messing up, shall we say. And you know, all cars eventually will be destroyed by the terrible state of Scottish roads. That's just simply the law and the rule of the road around here. But the Suzuki Jimny, it's like a little mountain goat. You don't feel bad putting the Suzuki Jimny through some flooded section of road. You don't feel guilty when you point this thing at a pothole because it feels like it's designed for it. It wants to go off road. It wants to tackle these things. It feels at home here. And I think what's quite interesting is from the exterior, especially the third generation of these little Jimnies, they feel quite soft. They're quite rounded. They are cute, shall we say. You know, they've got these beautiful bubble headlights. They've got this kind of very 90s styling to them, especially compared to the second and now the newest fourth generation. But underneath that, and the reason that it's so popular with off-road enthusiasts is that it has the beating heart of a classic Land Rover. It's a ladder frame chassis with the body bolted on top with a part-time four-wheel drive system. And that's what people want. And that's what makes these things so unbelievably in demand and of course, resilient to depreciation. Um, there was a recent article, I actually forget the company that put it out, I believe it was an insurance company, and they listed the top 10 vehicles that were most resistant to depreciation, uh, the cars that best held their value. Now, there were Lamborghinis, uh, Porsches, uh, there was actually the Volkswagen California, which is the uh, camper van version of the Transporter. So all these vehicles that start anywhere from, you know, uh, 180,000 pounds upwards of five, six, seven hundred thousand pounds, half a million pound supercars in some cases. And in that top 10 list was the Suzuki Jimny. And it shows, I bought this vehicle back in 2018 I could probably sell it for a similar price. And uh, for a vehicle that is purely designed for driving in the wintertime on horrendous roads, uh, well, it's not often the case. So let's look at the beating heart of the Suzuki Jimny, the power plant. Uh, now, if you're ever looking for the bonnet release on a Suzuki Jimny of this configuration, the earlier uh, pre-facelift models, it's actually in the glove box, which is quite unusual, but um, something that was quite common in older cars. And it's basically probably one of the last cars to be sold with uh, the boot release in the, or the bonnet release in the glove box. The other thing that is very annoying about this, so you've obviously got your little holder that keeps up uh, the boot and it sits down here. Now you'll see this is quite loose and if you drop this, it will smash against this, which is the uh, the, the reservoir for the, the windscreen spray and it will smash the bottle. As you can see, it's happened to me twice. This has fallen and broken twice and I've had to fiberglass it and fix it back up again. Not the greatest uh, design choice by Suzuki there, but this is the beating heart of um, the, the Suzuki Jimny, the, the mighty power plant. And, can you see it? It's, it's in there somewhere. In fact, it's so small that there is actually space in the engine bay of this already small vehicle for a larger engine, which is quite interesting. Um, there is a lot of space. People actually utilize this um, to put in secondary batteries. A lot of people put in leisure batteries into this uh, or secondary batteries for extra lights. It's a very small battery that comes as standard with the Jimny. And also for winches, um, because a lot of people put winches on these things. Obviously being a light vehicle, it's very easy to pull this thing out of ditches and drains or wherever it gets stuck, which can be quite often if you're bad at doing things off-road such as me. Um, now, this is a 1.3 litre 
Uh, there are different options available. Uh, there was a turbo diesel. Uh, obviously, this is a five-speed manual. There's also a four-speed automatic. The petrol manual is what I see most in the UK. I mean, you do see automatics and you occasionally see diesels, but I, I'm fairly sure this was the most popular. Now, 1.3 litres isn't very much, but do keep in mind that this is, by the when this came out, it was probably the largest of the engines ever offered uh, in a Suzuki. It's got about 86 horsepower, um, 110 newton metres of torque. Uh, it, it's it's not very much, but it does all the things that you need it for in terms of, you know, it's a small off-roader, it's not towing anything, uh, it's a very light vehicle, so it doesn't require a huge engine, and I mean, I've never found this thing underpowered. I would if I took it on big roads and on motorways, I'm sure, and I'm sure people have done other engine swaps. I've seen people do swaps with a slightly larger model, the Vitara, um, which is the bigger SUV, um, but you know, you're not going to get much out of this. You're not going to get much out of the car and the drivetrain anyway. So upgrading the engine really doesn't do much. Now, remember, of course, this was designed as a K car. Out in Japan, there are restrictions based on K cars and the size and the engine size, dimensions, all of that kind of thing. So I think out in Japan, this was offered with like a, an 800, 700 cc engine. So uh, this is the big engine, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but reliable and dependable. I've never heard of any major faults with these things. Um, they are, if you look after them and change the oil, basically engines that will just run and run um, forever. I think the way I would say it is, the body on this vehicle will rust out far, far, far before any of the engine components will let go. Um, these Jimneys rust. They rust like hell. Uh, they, they are very, very rusty uh, vehicles. Ladder on frame chassis, which of course uh, is liable to rust anyway. Specifically this one, the O2 edition was built by, I think it was Santana Motors. It was a Spanish company and they built these up until 2009. So this, the O2 edition. Now the O2 edition had therefore a different trim interior because it was made by a different manufacturer slightly. But also these Spanish models are specifically known to rust behind the headlights. Now mine aren't too bad, but um, it's something to watch out for. If you buy a, a rag top, a soft top or one made by Santana Motors, um, they specifically have bad areas of rust on these front wheel arches and behind the headlights so uh, buyer beware on that but i get buyer beware on chimneys <laughs> you're buying a chimney <laughs> beware it's gonna rust no surprises there and well if you wanted to see rust well here is rust <laughs> it's i mean like i say this vehicle is actually pretty good compared to a lot of suzuki chimneys that i've seen but under here you can also better see again what gives these things such great off-road credentials ladder frame chassis plenty of clearance uh, transfer case here in the center, two solid front axles, offset differentials, which are, again, something of a distinctive feature amongst your off-road capable vehicles. And uh, yeah, pretty good. I mean, the good thing about a vehicle that rusts this badly is when it's this small, it's quite easy to get to all the points and fix them. But uh, sometimes I do dread to think what goes on under here. <laughs> every day and every night, you come out, you listen closely, you'll just hear it, you'll hear it fizzing away as it slowly rusts away into nothing. But uh, yeah, beautiful wee thing. I love her. Rust or no rust, well, all rust. Now, steering on the Suzuki Jimny is, well, pretty vague to be honest. Uh, this uses a reciculating ball steering as opposed to the more common nowadays rack and pinion. Now, obviously that's really good if you're off-road. Uh, reciculating ball is a lot more sturdy and a bit more hard wearing. However, the problem comes uh, when you're back on the road again. It feels pretty vague. You can move the steering wheel around quite a lot here and we're still roughly going in a straight line. Now, I actually fitted a, a, a steering dampener, an Armstrong steering dampener, which attached to the body and then to the steering arm, and essentially helps kind of pull and guide and make the steering a little bit smoother. And it did have a pretty good effect on the overall driving experience, but, well, let's just say there is only so much you can polish a turd. I'm actually passing just right there a new Land Rover Defender. And it's really fascinating comparing the new Land Rover Defender to this because, and, and I very much like the new Land Rover, uh, I know it's a very controversial uh, redesign, I actually think it's a very nice uh, vehicle and an incredibly capable vehicle. But it's amazing to think the original kind of 90 series, the, the uh, original three door or two door Land Rover, uh, first series and second series, were the same length as this Suzuki Jimny. They were about uh, three, 3.6 meters long. Now, 
that's remarkable because when you now compare a Suzuki Jimny either to the old style Defender or to the new ones, you realize just how much modern SUVs and modern vehicles have grown and in some ways I think bloated. There is obviously a lot of reasons for it. Safety is a big one and obviously we don't want to make vehicles less safe but there's a lot of needless fat on new vehicles whether that be interior features or you know small gadgets that take up space add weight and that your average buyer is never going to use and again it's something that the Suzuki Jimny's never really dipped into and it's something that I'm always really happy to see even the newer models the, the brand new one it's great it's got Apple CarPlay it's got uh, lane keep assist it's got probably better crash protection certainly than this one but it doesn't stray too far it doesn't say stray too far into the meaningless stuff the stuff that adds weight and adds bloat and makes it a more difficult vehicle to own. So let's have a look now at the interior of uh, the Suzuki Jimny. And I'm gonna leave the roof off for here because it's, uh, yeah, it's nicer. It feels more roomy. Now, listen, pretty bare bones, pretty Spartan. Probably no surprise to any of you here. Uh, you don't even get a mirror on the sun visor. I had to stick that on there myself. But what I will say is this has a glove box. Now, my Nissan NV200 2018 model year doesn't have a glove box and it also doesn't have a passenger side airbag so <laughs> so laugh at the Jimny but they were selling cars and still are selling cars that don't have passenger side airbags or glove boxes but to be fair that's a commercial van so they they strip everything out of it that they think that you don't need now looking at it in here you might notice this is a slightly different sort of design to what you would actually expect to find in a 2005 model year Jimny by this time, they had actually upgraded and changed quite a lot of the interior design cues from the late 90s when this had been released. This is like the original um, late 90s interior. And it all relates to the fact that, again, this was made by Santana Motors, which is uh, a now defunct Spanish company. They made all of the soft top versions and they didn't, it seemed, receive the new trim from Suzuki. They just kind of used the old parts bin stuff. So all of theirs have the old original design and interior. Now, that's good because I quite like the old style interior, but um, there is a quite important point to that. Because they have the old style, they did not switch to the new form of four-wheel drive system. So the four-wheel drive system is the same. It works in the same way. However, for the update uh, that came around, I think in 2004, 2005, what happened was they switched out what is this lovely little transfer case lever, your, your two-wheel drive to four-wheel drive to four-wheel drive low, um, and they switched it out with three electronic buttons. And the idea would be that you'd stop, you put the clutch in, I believe, you press any one of the buttons, and then it'll engage the lockers or whatever and, and, and do all of that stuff. Um, I don't like that. I think that's a bad idea. I don't think many people liked it. People would accidentally press it sometimes and it would actually switch in motion, which is not a very good idea. And also, if you were to switch to manual locking hubs like I have, you'd have to rewire this thing as well too. Luckily, Santana Motors never received any of those sorts of upgrades and they retained this lovely transfer case lever well beyond the retirement that the rest of them went through. Now, what's interesting is in the fourth generation of the Suzuki Jimny, the newest one that came out in 2018, they switched back to this lever. So Suzuki themselves must have recognized that people much preferred this, the lever itself. Otherwise, features, you know, you've got uh, a relatively basic dashboard. It's got a four-wheel drive button that tells you when four-wheel drive is engaged. You have very similar climate controls to what you'll find in my 1989 Suzuki Super Caddy. Shockingly similar. Uh, similar to the point that I don't think they updated them in over a decade or maybe more. Um, you have you know, electrical adjustable mirrors, which is quite good. You've got electric windows, which is quite nice. This little cheapo um, glove box is pretty poor. This was updated again in the, in the revamp. In here, I keep, well, it's a winter car, so I keep my winter gloves in there, torch, some bits and pieces. This is kind of my tools van, so I've got a lot of bits and pieces in here, which I'll show you in the back as well too. Um, you have an, a, a stereo that I have swapped out, um, and you have what is essentially the, the cheapest little clock in history down here as well too. 12 volt socket and an ashtray that never ever gets used. Of course, the thing that is most critical to me when I'm in here is my iPod. That's right, if you guys are keeping track from my last video, I have an iPod for every single car that I own. <laughs> so I like my iPods. Uh, you pair an iPod up with uh, a little transmitter and you can use it in any car that you want. And I have mine specifically with my playlists set up for Rassi. I also have this. 
which is a little tiny model of a Suzuki Jimny that I bought from Japan and shipped over. But actually, this is one, the K-Car model, which means that it doesn't have the plastic fenders and flares that run around the outside of this one. And it's the revamped model, which has a little hood grill on it as well too. So you can start to even see in this, and also of course this being the tin top, the little design changes between this one uh, and the later models. And uh, I usually have that stuck up on the dashboard. So uh, yeah, fun vehicle, comfortable to be in, relatively good leg room. Uh, but of course this is the front. And as you guys may know or may not know, there are four seats in the Suzuki Jimny. Um, and I'll show you those now, except technically there's only two in mine. I'll show you, we'll go in the back. So we'll look in the back of the van now. You've obviously got your spare wheel here. And uh, this is my little interceptor sticker. I put these in the back of all my vehicles. Um, in here, as you can see, not much space, but I have changed the configuration around here slightly. I've actually put in almost like a, <laughs> a carpeted pickup bed, which I know is a bit of an odd choice, but essentially here's your two back seats. Normally, obviously they have their backs as well too. I've taken all of that out. And what we did is we built this sort of, like I say, load floor with a little shelf on the top. And that's because I use this a lot for tools. I use it for transporting stuff around and especially camera gear. So I've got camera bags here. These are actually the pillars for the seat belts. And I can use that to kind of attach stuff to. And yeah, it means that I can basically just throw stuff in here. With the seats not folded, um, there's no space in the back of this. Oh, there's about this much space that you can fit some items, maybe a couple of bags into. And there's a small little trough under here uh, that the jack and the stuff for changing over the wheel is normally kept. Now, that area, uh, I mean, the Jimny's, all areas of the Jimny rust, but that area more than anything rusts. Essentially, they have two layers of steel that they use back there, but there's a little bit of gap between them. So of course, what happens is water gets between that gap and it just rusts away. Um, it's probably in a pretty shocking state. My, my Jimny wasn't the worst. I did a lot of rust repair to this. Um, it's not needed to be welded yet, but it probably will do in the future. All Jimnies need welding, essentially. Um, but yeah, it, you can actually buy entire floors just as a big metal piece replacement so that people can weld in new ones. That's how bad this gets. But the other thing that you have to remember is the reason that people admire and love these Suzuki Jimnies so much is because, you know, they look from the outside quite bubbly and cute and they don't really look like they have the, the off-road credentials of a larger, meaner truck. But underneath this is the beating heart of a classic ladder frame chassis vehicle. This thing has a ladder frame chassis. It's body on frame. That means that the actual body of the truck has no structural integrity to the vehicle, really. It's all just sitting on top of this ladder frame. Um, now, that means that this whole body can rust away and you can still drive the truck as it is. Uh, very traditional, very old fashioned, similar to what you know a lot of your, your last remaining big tough 4x4s still have and a lot of vans and pickup trucks. And this thing has it as well, too. Um, um, it is a fully fledged four wheel drive vehicle in miniature and you get all the benefits of that and you get all the negatives of that as well too. Now my dream Suzuki Jimny is actually not the third generation. It took me a long time to actually come around to the third generation. I mean I've been seeing them for years and owning one changed my opinion certainly on the design and the style but I always thought and I still do think that they are somewhat um, rounded and a little bit too perhaps 90s. I'm not a fan of 90s and early 2000s car designs at all. And I always thought the pinnacle of Suzuki design was the second generation, the Samurai as it's often called out in the States or it was sold under in the States. Um, now, in the newest design revisions, they have brought it closer to that. Um, whereas now it looks like a sort of miniature G-Wagon, but I still think the second generation edges it out ever so slightly. It's just got that boxy look to it. It's just got those lovely sharp angles. It feels like a proper off-road beach buggy and it feels like a proper little miniature matchbox car. Now finding a second generation Suzuki in this country is pretty difficult. There are a lot of them around but you know rust is a terrible thing and Suzuki Jimny's rust like it is a blooming Olympic sport for them and they are the gold standard when it comes to rusting. My plan had always been, and maybe is something I'll do in the future, uh, would be to import one or to get an imported one from Japan. Now, the second generation were made and sold all the way up until around 1996, 1997, when this model then came in. 
I don't know how long they sold them in the UK, but certainly up in Japan, you can buy 1996, 1997 model years. And you know, they are relatively clean. You can get them imported to this country. Of course, they drive on the same side as us uh, in, in Japan and their cars tend to be a little bit cleaner as well too. Um, so that is the dream vehicle. My dream one would actually be a yellow second generation. And the reason that I want the yellow, and I, well, I love yellow, I actually painted the underside of this <laughs> chimney yellow. Uh, I love the color yellow anyway. But there is a film uh, from, I believe, 1981 called Restless, Restless Natives. It's one of my favorite films. It's about these two Scottish teens from Edinburgh who basically start going around on a motorbike. I believe it's actually a Suzuki motorbike and uh, start robbing American tourists on coaches as they drive around the Highlands. Now, there's this amazing chase scene. It's a genuinely incredible chase scene that was filmed in the Highlands um, where they, <laughs> they are being chased on this motorbike by the police who are in, I, I'm guessing, Ford Escorts or something. And confusingly, they're being chased by Japanese TV crews who have kind of become obsessed with these bandits, these Robin Hood style bandits, and are chasing them in yellow Suzuki Jimneys, second generation Jimneys. It is the maddest chase scene ever. It is so well shot, it's, it's wonderful. It's one of the things that made me really want a second generation uh, Samurai or, or uh, SJ, I think as they were sold in this country. Um, and in an even more interesting connection to Scotland, uh, or Rassi rather, where I'm from, uh, the number plate on one of those vehicles actually looks like it says Rassi. Now I've looked that number plate up and weirdly I can find it the wrong way around, um, but I can't seem to find it in that original Rassi configuration. So um, I will say, if anyone has that number plate out there in the UK, get in contact. Lovely there, it passed a very, very nice Alfa Romeo estate. Beautiful car, white, looked very new. I didn't get actually a look at the year. Um, big golden alloys on it and tires so thin they looked like they'd been spread onto the wheel like butter um, and they were going slow and credit to them they pulled over and let me pass but my goodness they were going slow and I'd go slow if I was driving a car like that I wouldn't exceed two miles an hour on these roads and that's the funnest thing about being in one of these vehicles because all of a sudden the tables turn you're on the mainland and you're driving on a motorway or an A road or whatever, every single person in their nan is laughing at you and overtaking you because you're racing to get up to 45 miles an hour. The moment you come on to Rassi, um, all of a sudden that flips. In fact, there's quite a lot of folks in, that come over in fancy cars who get a rude awakening when they come off the ferry because obviously if you think about the ramp and the pier, uh, all of a sudden the breakover angle of your car becomes quite important when the tide is low. Uh, but when you're now in the kind of rougher car, it doesn't have to be a 4x4, when you're in a car that you don't mind hitting the potholes, all of a sudden you're right up behind uh, these very, very fancy cars. You're pulling onto a verge to overtake them. You're racing off down the hill ahead of them. And I always find that very, very funny. Um, the islands are where fancy cars are shamed. <laughs> it's where they are embarrassed heartily. And it's where they are... Oh, I have seen a beautiful Porsche 911 uh, being helped back onto the road uh, by a Fiat Panda. And that was one of the greatest moments of my life, <laughs> seeing that, that car just, just, just giving it a little tug, uh, pulling it back onto the road. I always carry a, a tow rope in my car for that reason, um, uh, the, the joys of island life. But yeah, I've not really had much of a chance to take this thing out, mainly because I've been working on my new van and yeah, in the summertime, yeah, you don't find you use this as much, but I mean, you might have noticed driving around, I've just always got a smile on my face driving this car. Uh, it is silly and it is rattly and it is cheap, but it's just so full of character. It's like owning a little dog, you know, you just, you're always willing it on. It, it's really quite fun. You know, I'm not somebody who really names my cars. I've never really found, you know, I, I sometimes have nicknames and stuff for them, but I've never really personified my vehicles like a lot of people do. And that feels like something I would do, but it's never really stood out to me that much. And I, it's the same with this. I just call this the truck. And I actually think it's quite funny calling this a truck because it's so small. But what's really interesting is no vehicle that I've ever had 
exudes so much personality in this one. All the time, you just feel like it's again, it's like a little mountain goat, and it's just it's constantly it just wants to it wants to run off the nearest hill, it wants to jump up somewhere, it wants to kind of skid across the road and uh, go through these potholes. It's, it's great. It feels like a it's a great wee companion vehicle, and when you get out of the car to take some photos and then look round back at it, it's always really really fun. Um, just seeing it sitting there waiting for its next adventure. Uh, brilliant little vehicle. Long may she reign. So yes, thank you very much for watching my video, my little retrospective on my Suzuki Jimny and also why I think they are just some of the best small four-wheel drive SUVs out there. Yeah, I, I, I'm in completely different clothes. It's a continuity nightmare. <laughs> I filmed this over multiple days. But yeah, there's so much I didn't even talk about. The amazing uh, original alloys and also the kind of off-road wheels that I bought for it that look amazing on this. Uh, the tow bar. Uh, I put in a tow bar. Uh, you can actually use this for, for towing, you know, a fair amount. I take stuff up to the house quite a lot. I've got a small trailer uh, and stuff for it. And the sound system. I put new speakers and a new sound system and everything through it. So you could, I could talk all day, <laughs> but I hope this has given you guys uh, a good run through about the, the Suzuki Jimny, some of the history of it, um, the capabilities and why I think they're so fantastic. And also just the reason I love my little characterful uh, Jimny. As I'm literally holding on to this, I, I'm pushing at the metal and I can feel my fingers going through it. So I'm going to stop doing that. But yeah, thank you very much for watching. And uh, I'm going to go... Listen to this thing slowly rust away. Bye-bye.